Goodbye, honey. See you at supper time, I said, as I offered my lips for Roy to kiss me. He put his hands round my waist and squeezed me, stroking my back. I feel guilty leaving you here, Ellen. It's such a nice day. Do you want to go out for a drive instead? I shook my head. I know you've been looking forward to your golf game, Roy, and anyway, I've things to do, baking and so on. Maybe we can go out for dinner when you get back. Have a good game. Thanks. Oh, well, have a good time yourself, Ellen. He squeezed me again and slid his hand down to pat my rear. Hmm, not bad for a grandmother in her sixties. I slapped his arm lightly. The neighbors may be watching, but I pursed my lips to him anyway to kiss again. You're not bad yourself, old man. Glad you can keep up with me. I watched as he got into the car. He blew me another kiss and I waved back as he drove out of the driveway. It was a nice fall day and it might be the last golf game he got in this year. I went into the kitchen, turned on the stove and pulled out the recipe card. The recipe was simple enough, and goodness knows, I really didn't need a card. I had used this cookie recipe often enough. This batch were for a church bake sale, and my younger daughter Ruth and her two girls, Madison and Jessica, were coming over later. I made an extra big lot, as the girls were always enthusiastic about my home-baked cookies. I was almost finished and was about to wash my hands when there was a knock at the door. I peered out the side window and saw a familiar figure. I opened the door for him. Well, what brings you here, Dwayne? Oh, excuse my hands. I've just been baking. I turned my cheek for him to give me a kiss. Dwayne's brothers had gone through that phase when they did not want to kiss their grandmother, but never Dwayne. Dwayne was the youngest son of my older daughter, Sarah. He and his three brothers had been frequent visitors, but as the three older ones grew, their visits had dropped off. I was sorry not to see them so much, but I knew teenage boys and young men usually found more interesting things to do than visit their almost 70-year-old grandparents. Dwayne was different. We had always got on well and he was a frequent visitor. Dwayne sniffed the air appreciatively. Maybe it's the smell of your cookies. Grandma, he grinned then gave me a great big hug. Like some coffee? I said. I was about to have a cup myself. Sure. Where's Grandpa? He had a golf game. Did you want to see him? No. I mean not particularly. I was just going to go off on a holiday and I thought I would come and see you both before I left. A holiday? That's nice. Where are you going? Oh, I thought I would take two weeks, drive out to California. Probably San Francisco, drive down the coast to Los Angeles and San Diego. Anyone going with you? I asked, raising my eyebrows. I liked Dwayne. He was a nice boy and I was surprised he hadn't settled down with a girl yet. Anytime I had asked if there was anyone in his life he had just smiled quietly and shook his head. I always had hopes. He was a nice-looking young man and seemed to be kind. I knew he would make a good parent. It was the same this time. No, I'll just be going myself. You know, Grandma, I would swear you were trying to fix me up. I gave him my sweetest smile. Well, isn't that a grandmother's right? Maybe someday you'll meet the right girl and get married, and you know, I think you'd be good with children, Dwayne. He colored slightly. Gee, Grandma, don't rush things. But enough of me, how are you doing? I shrugged. Thanks for asking, but Grandpa and I are both well, apart from the occasional colds. You know we try to keep active and eat well. That was true, but I had something else going for me, something from almost half a century ago. We chatted on a bit and I saw him finish three of my cookies. My heart filled with pride when I looked at him. Just then Ruth arrived with her two girls. They ran to Dwayne and hugged him. I saw the pleasure in his eyes as he knelt down to talk to them. He had a way with children, full of stories for them, and always glad to play games with them. How are you Dwayne? asked Ruth. Fine, Aunt Ruth. And how are your parents? Dwayne's mother was married to Henry Klein, a lawyer in one of the corporations downtown. He was a staunch member of one of the more fundamentalist churches. 
He was also a local organizer for the Republican Party, but I didn't hold it against him. The pleasantries went on for a few minutes then Duane looked at his watch. I guess I'd better be on my way. So, Grandma, see you when I get back. He affectionately kissed his two nieces and Ruth and gave me a big hug. See you in a week or so. Where is Duane going? asked Ruth when he had left. He said he was taking a holiday, driving to California. Ruth nodded slightly, as if she had expected that. I thought it strange, but Madison and Jessica were yelling at me to play a game with them and I let it pass. Duane was a nice fellow indeed. His mother was a bit uptight. I thought she was too influenced by Henry, but it was not my business to interfere. Ruth was much more easygoing. Funny how your children can be so different. It was three weeks before I saw Duane again. He looked tanned from the sun, but he did not seem rested. In fact, he looked as if he had lost weight. How was your visit? Where did you get to? I asked. I went to San Francisco, as I said, but instead of the coast I drove down the Central Valley and spent some time at Palm Springs. Wasn't it terribly hot? Yes, warmer than this, but it was pleasant this time of year, and anyway, the place I was at was well air-conditioned. I noticed his manner. He had something on his mind. Is something troubling you, Duane? You seem ill at ease. Grandma, he hesitated, you and I have always been close. I feel I can confide in you. You've never been judgmental of me. I've got something to tell you. Please don't be offended. I was concerned. Offend me with what? You have always tried to steer women to me, or me to them. I should tell you it's no use. He hesitated. I, I think I'm gay. What? I started. I wanted to yell at him but I held my tongue in check. I wondered if I had been a fool. The signs were there. Or were they? Oh no, surely he was just shy with girls, and mistaken. Oh Duane, you're kidding me. Are you sure? Come on, just relax, I'm sure it's just that the right girl hasn't come along yet. When she does you'll fall in love with her. I know your mother is looking forward to grandchildren sometime. He looked at me, tears now swelling in his eyes. He was sniffling, shaking his head. He dried his eyes on the tissue I held to him. I patted him on his shoulders. Come on now. We'll say no more about it. Now tell me where else you were. He told me about his trip west. I had never seen them, but Colorado sounded beautiful. So did Arizona. My friend Rachel, who lived at a place between Flagstaff and Prescott, had always been at me to visit her, when Duane had left, I kept thinking about what he had said. Surely the boy was mistaken. I knew he would eventually be happy. He was my favorite grandson, after all. I saw Duane rather infrequently over the next weeks. At first he still seemed troubled, but then one visit he seemed much calmer. He embraced me tightly as he left. I thought he was turning a corner. Roy and I were sitting at supper the next night when the telephone rang. Roy answered it. I saw the color drain from his face. He was nodding. Anything we can do? Do you want us at the hospital? I felt myself go cold. What is it? I screamed. Roy nodded and put down the phone. That was Henry, he said. He's calling from the hospital. It's Duane. He tried to kill himself. I was already rushing to get my coat, but Roy held me. Ellen, we'd just be in the way. He has his parents and his brothers. But he may die. I cried. Roy shook his head. Actually, he will probably be all right. It was an overdose of sleeping pills he took. He was in his car, but a policeman found him fairly quickly and called an ambulance. They pumped out his stomach and he should be okay. But why? I wailed. Ellen, I don't know. I'm sure we will find out sometime. Indeed, Duane made it. A few days later he was discharged from hospital, but when I asked Sarah about it she shook her head. I don't know. He has seemed preoccupied the last few years, but he wouldn't tell us what was bothering him. Maybe too much time on his hands. 
Henry and the other three boys have tried to get him involved in sports like they are, but he's not interested. When I saw Dwayne again I was shocked. He had lost much more weight. Dwayne, how are you? I embraced him. I stroked his cheek. You know, you should eat more. You are wasting away. Yes, Grandma, he nodded patiently, I'll make sure I eat more. Dwayne? I asked. Your father said you took an overdose. Surely it was an accident? No, Grandma, it was not. I wanted to kill myself but I was unsuccessful. But why? I don't fit in. Remember I told you I was gay. And you were wrong, I insisted. You're just mistaken. No, he interrupted, it's true. Remember that time I went to California. I wanted to meet people like me. Try to understand my feelings. I sat down heavily. I had heard of the gay communities there, and to think my grandson, my favorite was one of them. I paced about the room, distraught. And Palm Springs, he went on. I went there. It has a large gay community. I even went to a resort for gay men and... Stop, stop, I screamed. You're torturing me. At last I sat down with him, holding my hands to stop them shaking. He was my favorite. I wanted him to be happy. Do your parents know? He shook his head. And how were your experiences in Palm Springs? I asked, measuring out the words, choosing them carefully. Not good. Something was missing. See, I tried to control myself. You're not really gay. Oh yes I am. I'm attracted to men, but even making love to a man, or having him make love to me, it's not enough. I like women too, but as friends. I want to talk about their lives with them, their relationships, clothes, their children. I want to be like them. I would even like to be a woman in all ways. I feel I am a woman in a man's body. I want to live as a woman, have a man make love to me, and have children but I know that's impossible. I've the body of a man. My genes are male. I don't have a womb or breasts. Even if I could afford the money and be altered surgically and take hormone doses, I could never conceive, bear or nurse children. I'd just be a fake. He began crying brokenly. My mind was in turmoil. I loved him very much. I wanted to help him but I had never expected this. I felt so helpless. Dwayne, I said, you could adopt children, and lots of women can't nurse their children, or don't want to. Yes, I know. I've even thought of that, but I'd still think it was a sham. And anyway, it wouldn't be like bearing them myself. I saw he was desperate. So was I. I had to save him. I sat and thought of something that had happened, so many years ago. Dwayne, I said, hesitating, let me think about this. Come and see me in a week. I may be able to help you. Promise me you won't do anything drastic before then. I looked him up and down. Oh, also, your hair is fairly long. Don't get it cut until you see me again. And don't cut your fingernails. He looked at me with a curious expression but nodded. I gave him a hug and saw him out the door. Then I sat down with a cup of coffee and thought hard. Finally I got on the telephone to my old friend Rachel in Arizona. A week later Dwayne called me. You asked me to call you in a week. Can I see you now, Grandma? Yes, come over. I have someone I want you to meet. My heart was thumping, but I smiled nervously to my guest. Fortunately, Roy was out again, at a Shriners meeting this time. Dwayne arrived in about ten minutes. Come in, Dwayne, I said. He looked surprised to see my guest. Rachel had aged very well. Like me, she was in her late sixties now, but was still very well preserved, her figure slim and curved like a younger woman, her face almost unlined. I knew her hair had really turned almost white, but she kept it dyed auburn, and today she had it styled. She was even wearing makeup and her clothes were stylish, a knee-length tan skirt and a blouse with a small floral pattern with an expensive-looking sweater draped over her shoulders. I thought I was as pretty as her, but Rachel seemed to have a better dress sense. 
I thought wryly of those first times when I had to give her advice on clothes and grooming. Dwayne, this is my cousin Rachel from Arizona. She is visiting us for a bit, and, I hope you don't mind, I asked her advice about you. He looked hurt. Grandma, it was meant to be confidential. I know, but I am concerned about you. I've explained what you said about your feelings to Rachel. Do you still feel that way? Yes, maybe even more so. Dwayne, began Rachel, Ellen tells me that you are very unhappy. But, you know, being gay no longer has the same stigma that it once had. I'm sure you could live as a woman, dress that way, yes, have some operations. With hormones you could almost be like a woman. No one would know, and if you thought of yourself as one it. No, it wouldn't, broke in Duane. I feel I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. It's a man's body, he emphasized, but I want to be able to carry babies, my own. I want to live with an ordinary man in an ordinary house, dress like an ordinary woman, have ordinary children. No mother wants to think of their children as ordinary, I said, trying to lighten the conversation. Dwayne even managed to smile a little. Well, you know what I mean, Grandma. I looked at Rachel. There were tears at the corners of her eyes, but when she spoke her voice was harsh. And just what would you know of it, Dwayne? You are full of fanciful ideas. I suppose you think being a woman all about wearing stylish, pretty dresses, smart shoes, pretty lingerie and makeup, and having a good-looking man pay attention to you, take you out and make blissful love to you. Don't you know there's the bother of monthly periods, with pads or tampons, backache and tender breasts. Then when your periods end at menopause, you have to go through all sorts of physical turmoil and readjustment. And having babies is no cakewalk. Your figure gets swollen, and you have difficulty even turning in bed. I had three kids and each hurt like hell. Then there's the pain and trials of raising the kids, going through selfish behavior, tantrums, endless messy diapers, toilet training, difficulties at school and so on. You are tied down with them for years, your best years. And raising them is expensive. And then, apart from that, even though things are better now, at work you are at a disadvantage to men. You are expected to pay more attention to your appearance and clothes or you will be criticized, even by other women. You have to work harder. You get some of the less pleasant jobs. You are treated worse. Men are stronger, and you have to learn to handle them correctly, not wound their bloody male pride. They are more assertive than women, but if you try to be like them people will call you a bitch. Do you really want that? Yes, I think so, he sobbed, but you come here and insult me. What would you really know about my misery, the pain I am feeling? Duane, she spoke softer now. What I am going to tell you has to be absolutely confidential. Do I have your promise not to say anything to anyone? Duane looked surprised, but nodded. Rachel took his hands in hers. Then I have a secret to tell you. You know the turn of phrase, been there, done that? Well, I was once a man. Duane looked closely at Rachel and shook his head in disbelief. Who are you kidding? Yes, it's really true. I was a man, but now I'm a woman, completely. Complete in all parts of my anatomy. Even if you looked at my chromosomes, I am completely a woman. It was a magic spell that did it. Another secret. I don't know if you've heard the story, but it's about your grandmother's brother John, who they said went to California and disappeared. Duane's brow furrowed. Yes, I heard about him. He looked at me questioningly. Well, I'm really John, or at least, I was John. What happened was a friend visited us once, that time Ellen and I lived together. We had an antique bookstore then. My friend, Fred Jimball was his name, had brought along an old book. It had some spells in it and we read one. It was dumb, I know, but who would have believed in magic spells in this day and age? I was half drunk at the time as well, and not as cautious as I should have been. It turned out that the spell turned all who were in earshot of it into beautiful women. It sure did with me. Ellen was there too, she was already a good-looking, but it made her into a real beauty. Duane looked at me skeptically. Yes. 
It's true, I whispered. What about your friend? He was killed in a car crash very soon after he left our house. We think that he was also affected by the spell and when it began to change him he lost control of the car. It crashed and burned. The spell makes men unconscious when they are changing. Women, or at least Ellen did, they get shivery but don't faint or anything. I can tell you, waking up and finding myself in a woman's body was a real shock. I was in terror. It took me a long time just to accept it and then to get used to it. It was a struggle. I had to make a completely new life for myself. Where had your friend got the book? Rachel shook her head. I don't know. Fred was an antique furniture dealer and said he had found it in an old piece that he had bought somewhere in Louisiana. Apart from that, we don't know. The book was quite old. It was faded and stained. Goodness knows what its history was. Part of it, the instructions, was written in German, in an old German script, but the actual spell was in some other language I didn't recognize. In fact there was also a reverse spell, but as I said, Fred went off with the book before the first spell took effect, and when we heard he had crashed, I thought the book would have been destroyed in the fire. It turned out I was wrong. It must have been thrown from the car as it crashed. One of the policemen, a friend of Roy's, gave it to us a year later. It had been picked up near the crash, but they didn't connect the two. To them it just seemed like another old book, and he gave it to us as we had the antique bookstore. You could have used the reverse spell then, and changed back. No, by then it was too late. In the year since I changed, I had grown to accept being a woman, in fact, Rachel blushed, I had got to even liking it better than being a man. Also, I'd had enough stress with getting used to being a woman. I didn't want to have to go through the process all over again to return to being a man. But the main reason was, by then I had fallen in love with a man, my late husband, Bill Lawson. So could I see that book, Rachel? Unfortunately not. I destroyed it. Burned it. Threw it in a stove. I saw Dwayne's face fall. But why? He said, it could have been useful. Dwayne? Rachel was not finished. As I just said, it was very stressful for me. I was a happy heterosexual man until the spell changed me. Then it must have taken me months to adjust. Eventually, I was happy with my change. I suppose the female hormones gradually overcame my male conditioning. The reason I destroyed it was I was so happy that I did not want any temptation of changing back, and I also wanted to make sure no others would have to undergo the same experiences. Now Ellen tells me you would like it. You could have used it. There was a sudden gleam of hope in Dwayne's face. He looked Rachel up and down. You seem to have done well. You seem happy, and I must say, you don't look like a sixty-year-old. Oh! A sudden realization hit him. That's why Grandma always looks so young for her age. Yes, that's right. And I should say I am happy too. Bill and I had a great life together. Yes, he died of a heart attack two years ago. Rachel took a tissue to a tear at the side of her eye. I'm sorry. She blew her nose. When I spoke to you earlier I was deliberately rather harsh. I wanted to make sure you were absolutely determined. I have been lucky. I had a wonderful husband. We raised three great kids. I enjoy being a woman. I'm happy that it turned out that way. But would you be as lucky? Not all women have a nice well-off middle-class life like I had. She looked Dwayne up and down. Although I suppose you have one advantage over me. I liked girls as women. The last thing I would have dreamed of before my change was letting a man make love to me. But Ellen tells me you think you are gay? Dwayne flushed slightly. But if the book is destroyed, I can't do anything. Or do you remember the spell? Rachel shook her head. Ellen heard it too, but I asked her about it and we can't remember many of the words of the spell. I would tell you to forget the whole thing, but Ellen is very concerned about you. She says you even tried to kill yourself. So, maybe against my better judgment, I have been talking with Ellen about what to do. We wonder if a hypnotist could get us to remember the words. But wouldn't the hypnotist then change into a woman? Good point. 
We wondered about that, but that would only happen if the hypnotist was a man. We'd need to find a female hypnotist. But unfortunately there may be more to it than that. The original spell book was covered in skin, human skin. I'd bet that had something to do with its powers. Maybe the hypnotist would be unaffected. Dwayne looked horrified. Where on earth could we get human skin? You'd need a corpse and no undertaker or hospital would let you have any. It'd be unprofessional to say the least, not to mention illegal, and even if they did, they would be very, very curious. I have been thinking about that, I said. I wonder if the skin really has to be dead. What would it be like if we wrote the spell, assuming the hypnotism is successful, on my body, or yours, Rachel? Rachel's eyes opened wide, emphasizing her eyeliner and mascara. It's worth trying. But where do we find a suitable hypnotist? Are you kidding? I said. The magazines are full of ads for hypnotists, claiming they can stop you smoking, or get you to lose weight, or all sorts of other things. Rachel cocked her head skeptically. Yes, but how many of these are genuine? I'll tell you, I said, one of the ladies in my bridge group, her husband was a psychiatrist. They sometimes use it, and Roy has a few contacts in the police. They occasionally use hypnotists to help jog witnesses' memories of crimes and so on. Dwayne, I said. I'm still uneasy about this. Yes. I will help you, but even if we can do it, you are going to have some problems, major ones. You will have to build a complete new identity, cut yourself off from all friends and relatives, even more than if you were just to come out of the closet, as they say. At least it will not be so much trouble nowadays getting you some identification. People may still snigger at transsexualism, but, at least it's not unknown. You will be able to change your name and driver's license and so on. But by far the most troublesome part will be our own family. What about your parents? Even if we can do this thing, they will get, not just a gay son, not just a transvestite, not just a surgical transformation, but a full-fledged, genuine daughter. Your brothers would have a real sister. It would be quite a shock, wouldn't it? Can you face them and the rest of your family? Could they accept you, or even face you? Your aunts, uncles, cousins as well. Someone will want to know all about it, and the tale will be out. And what would they think of me? And what would it do to the family? Finally, I am not prepared to face all the media hoopla. I didn't want it 50 years ago when my brother John was unexpectedly transformed into Rachel here, and I sure don't want it now. What about your co-workers? This has to be absolutely secret. Dwayne shook his head. I don't know. Co-workers are easy. I had been thinking of getting a new job anyway, or going to college. I could even leave the city and start somewhere else. But mom and dad, I wouldn't want to hurt them and I can see they would be shocked at my change and curious as to how it happened. I am afraid that whatever you do, Dwayne, it's going to hurt somebody, I said, but the worst would be if you killed yourself. If you did use the spell, assuming we can get it, there would be a terrible upset in the family. If you disappear, it will be a blow to your parents. Maybe the best thing would be to go off, and then gradually break contact with your family, but they will always wonder about you, your mother especially. But maybe that option is the best of a bad bunch. Rachel looked at me. She nodded slowly in approval. I took his shoulder. All right, Dwayne, let us see what we can do. Come back in, no. Give me call in about a week. Rachel and I watched out the window as he drove off. She shook her head. God, who'd have thought it? We are back to that damn spell after all that time. I wish I'd never seen it. I embraced her. You couldn't see what would happen, and besides, you're happy how things turned out for you aren't you? You had a nice loving husband, you have three successful children and several beautiful grandchildren, just like me. All right, I know, but let's get on with things, starting tomorrow. Why don't we try that psychiatrist's wife you know? Yes, that's Sadie Bloom. I'll get in contact with her and see if her husband can recommend any women hypnotists from his psychiatry days. Won't she be curious? 
I grinned at Rachel. Probably. Sadie is a bit nosy but I'll just say it is a nutty cousin from Arizona who is getting forgetful and wants to remember some stories her mother told her. Rachel made a face at me. In fact we were successful the first time. Dr. Bloom suggested a female hypnotist and we made an appointment to see her. We saw right away that she was ideal and very friendly. We explained that it was teenage prank we wanted to remember, that we were writing a story about our lives and wanted some details. She leaned back in her chair, with her glasses down at the end of her nose and looked at us skeptically. Ladies, something is not quite right, but you'll be paying me well enough, so I won't ask any questions. Okay, when do you want to try this out? Remember, I can't guarantee the results. Well, both of us were present, so maybe we both remember what the words were, somewhere in our subconscious. Maybe you could hypnotize me first and Rachel can take notes, then put her under and I take notes, and we can compare to see if we have the words the same. When is convenient for you? She looked at her diary. How about the day after tomorrow, around two? Usually these things take about an hour each. Now, how about some shopping? I said to Rachel as we left the office. That is one thing I miss. We used to have so much fun shopping together after you changed. It's a good thing I had daughters to accompany me shopping when you moved to Arizona. God, I miss you. I miss you too, but Bill was all keen to leave this flat countryside. He liked the mountains and it's a nice locality, just near Prescott where I live. I did think about moving back after Bill passed away, but I've got two settled there now with new friends, and besides, it's nearer California where all of my kids now live. Just like old times, we poked around several shops but we as we were soon feeling the need of a rest our paths led us to the Starbucks in the mall. Rachel sipped her latte and shook her head in wonder. This place has really expanded and changed. I don't recognize it. You know, I still remember that first time when I was changed and you took me here. I was terrified in case anyone recognized me. No danger of that. The spell sure worked well. You looked good. Hell, you still look good. So do you, said Rachel. We grinned at each other. But it was my first time shopping, as a woman, I mean. Well, it was either that or you let me do your shopping for you, and I didn't have time for that, and I had to get you able to fend for yourself. We were barely back home when Dwayne called. His face was gray. Dwayne, what's the matter? His face had a wry expression. The good news is that one of my problems is solved. I no longer have to worry what my parents' reaction would be. The bad news is that they now know I am gay, and they kicked me out. He began to cry. Oh, Dwayne, how did they find out? I asked. Did you tell them? Yes, eventually. It was that resort I was at in Palm Springs. I thought they were supposed to be discreet, but they sent a brochure to me at home. Mom was suspicious and opened it. She confronted me and I admitted it all to her. She told Dad and we had a big fight. They say I'm never to go back there again. I did not know what to think. This made our plans easier, but I was distressed at his anguish. I knew there would be trouble. I heard a car come into the driveway. It was Dwayne's mother, Sarah. Sarah's mouth opened when she saw Dwayne. Has he told you? She asked. Yes, just now. Sarah was furious. She yelled at Dwayne. And what do you think about it now, Dwayne? Shame on you, upsetting your grandmother like that. And what a shame for our family. Your father is so upset. Oh, Dwayne, how could you? Her anger spent, she collapsed on the sofa. I held her and comforted her until at last she got control of herself. Dwayne, she said between sniffles, you've upset me terribly, but it's your life. You do as you want, I am very disappointed, but you're still my son. I don't want to lose you. Please keep in touch. I know your dad has told you to stay away, but maybe he'll eventually come around to accepting you. But you're my youngest son, my baby. I wanted to see you settle down, get married, raise a family of your own. I had hoped to hold your children, my grandchildren. Now I won't. 
She started crying afresh. She rushed to our washroom. I felt teary-eyed too and Rachel was looking stricken. Will I tell her our plans? I whispered to Rachel. Rachel shook her head and whispered back. I don't think that would be a good idea. You and I had this secret for years. Now Dwayne knows about it. Now you want Sarah to know about it. That's enough. The fewer the better, less distractions for us. Sarah was back in a few minutes, her eyes were still red, but she looked more composed. Dwayne, she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so disappointed. Now you'll never marry, never have children. I thought you would make such a good father too. I know it's your life, but your father is so disappointed, shocked too. I have to go now. Bye mom, she said, and kissed me. She looked at Dwayne. Please try to keep in touch with me somehow. She hugged him. I looked at Rachel and Dwayne. We did not seem to know what to say. I felt drained. At last I got myself together. I looked at my watch, then at them. Now, I think you'd better go, Dwayne. Roy will be back soon and I don't want him asking questions. There are too many red eyes around here. Why don't you book into a hotel or motel, or is there some friend you can stay with? Call us tomorrow evening. I broke the news to Roy when he returned home. Rachel was diplomatically keeping out of sight. Roy sagged visibly. At last he poured himself a drink of whiskey. You know. I was beginning to wonder about that boy. He seemed to be at a loss for words. Will he still come by here? I shrugged. I don't know well Ellen, if you see him, tell him he is still welcome here. I don't like it, but I'm sure he can't control the way he is made. I was surprised at Roy's tolerance. In some ways he had seemed the most straight-laced of our family. Maybe he was getting more tolerant as he got older. I hugged him, but I did not tell him about our plans. I drove with Rachel to the hypnotist's office two days later. We explained again what we wanted. We said that we had been reading something about fifty years ago, and wanted to remember it. The hypnotist shook her head skeptically. I may be lucky, but that's a long time ago. Of course, if it was something that had a great effect on your lives, it would help. I saw Rachel's eyes flickering, but she said nothing. Okay? Who's first? said the hypnotist. I pointed to Rachel. Maybe Rachel first. I'll take notes. I watched as she had Rachel lie back on a couch and get comfortable. I turned on our tape recorder. The hypnotist was speaking to her very softly and in an even tone. I saw Rachel's eyes begin to close. After a few minutes the hypnotist nodded to me. Rachel, she said softly, it's a long time ago. You are with your friend Fred. He is visiting you at your old house, the one on Redbud Avenue. Ellen is there too, you are all looking at an old book. You are turning to the end. Can you see what is written there? Amazed, I saw Rachel's mouth begin to open. She was mumbling. Zur Mackin, she began, then the sounds were indistinct. The hypnotist shrugged to me. Rachel? What is it you are reading? She said in a calm voice. Rachel seemed to be having some contortions, then she lay still and suddenly it came out clear and slowly, as if she were reading the book, so that I could write down the sounds easily. Naha Eitai, Nasrek Wai, just as it had been so long ago. I began shivering with emotion at the memories, but I kept writing. In five minutes or so it was over. Rachel began trembling again, faint gurgling sounds coming from her mouth, then she was quiet and lay asleep on the couch. Did you get what you wanted? asked the hypnotist. She was perspiring. I wonder what that was. I have never heard anything like it. I think so, I said. I've got it recorded. Actually I was carefully watching the hypnotist to see if she began showing signs of the spell, but she was unaffected. I'll just let Mrs. Lawson sleep for a few minutes more, she said, and then I will wake her. When the hypnotist awoke her, Rachel remembered nothing. So, she said. I think we were successful, I smiled at her. Now my turn. Are you up to taking notes? Sure, just remember not to swear when you are under, she grinned. 
I vaguely remember the hypnotist's first words, then I remember nothing until I felt Rachel shaking me. I felt a bit washed out, but I could feel myself getting more alert by the minute. So how was I? Anything useful? I don't know. I could hardly make out what you said. I grimaced, but there was nothing we could do. We thanked the hypnotist and paid her. To my relief, she still showed no signs of any impending change. Either the spell was inactive to women, or it needed to be written on human skin, or we had the wrong words. Rachel gestured to our notes, this is our only chance, you know. Maybe. I did not want to think about the alternatives. We could hardly eat supper in out excitement, but we forced ourselves to relax before sitting down at the table with our notes. Rachel's was the most complete, then, when we turned to the copy that was taken of my words, we saw the sounds were identical, and at the right places. Even so, there were a few blanks, so we wrote down words that approximated the sounds from the tape recorder. It was quite short, only a few dozen words, or sounds. They were unlike any language we knew. After two hours we were finished. We stared at each other apprehensively. I think this is as good as we're going to get, said Rachel. I think it's time to relax. How about some wine? We were relaxing with a bottle of a nice Gewürztraminer, talking about the old days, when Rachel shook her head slightly. I wonder what the history of that book was? What would it have been used for? It was certainly very old, I replied, probably hundreds of years. Who knows what it was used for? A witch's book of home remedies perhaps, but those that changed a man into a woman and vice versa, and reverse spells? Maybe to get rid of political enemies. Hey, maybe we could sell the spell to the Republicans or the Democrats? Maybe that would cause a few unusual alliances in Congress. Or maybe just cause Congress, sexual, I mean, in the House and Senate. I wondered who would be screwing who, laughed Rachel. I wondered if I had given her too much to drink. You know, Rachel, I sometimes regret you destroyed it. It would have been interesting to have some language expert look at it. Rachel shook her head. I don't regret it at all. Oh well, maybe a tiny bit, but I thought it was too dangerous to have around. Anyway, it's water under the bridge now. The phone rang. I picked it up. How was it? Good, Dwayne, I think. So you have what you need. Yes. I think we have all we are going to get. All we need now is you. When do you want to try it? Shouldn't I get some things ready first? How do you mean? Well, clothing for one. Good thinking, Duane, but the trouble is we don't know what size you will be. You will shrink, but to what size I can't tell. Rachel, or John, I should say, lost a few inches. You can use your t-shirts, even your shorts, if they are boxer style, as underwear or night stuff, maybe even your socks, but women's hips are way bigger than men's, so I'd be very surprised if your pants fitted you, even if you were to try them in a low slung style. You will need some bras, but that will have to wait until we can get you to a store. Then you will need some proper fitting women's pants and jeans, panties too, and I think you should get some skirts, dresses, and blouses. Your sweaters may still be okay, as long as the style is not too masculine. Sweat shirts should be okay as they are. Any of your dress shirts could do for nightwear as well, but you really should get proper night dresses or women's pajamas. It would be a pity to change sex and then look like a dyke. I heard a slight laugh at the other end of the line. Grandma, such language. At least he still had a sense of humor. What you will need right away is a wig. I will get you one. It will do until your hair grows. Anyway, Duane, come over tomorrow. If the spell works you will be unconscious about a day, and pretty woozy for a day after that. Grandma, what about Grandpa? Does he know about our plans? Not at all. He's going off to a Shriners due in Chicago, so he will be away until Wednesday night, so that gives us three days. Now, on more mundane things, you don't want anyone to connect what you are now with the new person you will be. 
You can get new ID when you are changed, but it would be best to sell your car now, in case someone recognizes it that you could keep it, but only if you make absolutely sure you never run into your family or any friends again. Oh, have a have a bath before you come over. You'll sweat a lot in the change. Bye. God, I hope this works, I said. Rachel just grimaced, I remember I slept a lot. I suppose I was in shock. At least Dwayne wants these changes. Just then Roy arrived back home from his meeting. So what were you two girls up to today? Oh, just going over old memories, said Rachel. Dwayne arrived late on Sunday evening, carrying a hold all. He was looking pale. What's that? I asked. It's some of my clothes. I took the bus here. I did as you said and sold my car. Yes, that's good. You will need the money anyway, for new clothes and establishing yourself again. Where are you staying? I was booked into a motel, but I have checked out. I have booked a room in the Hickory for Wednesday night. Okay, I said. All set. We'd better do this in the downstairs rooms. I don't want any interruptions and especially not from the rest of your family. You okay? I held his hands. They felt cold. You have now seen them the last time as Dwayne. As far as they know you will have disappeared. They will not see you as Dwayne ever again, if we are successful. He gulped. Let's get on with it. I had laid out some blankets and had some soap and towels ready. Okay, Rachel, who do we write the spell on? I said. Oh, I guess me. Hold on. She went into her bedroom and came out wearing a pair of brief shorts. Gee, she really still had great legs, I thought. She pointed. There, on the thigh. Here's a pen. Start writing it and careful you don't poke me hard. I'd hate to be permanently tattooed with the spell. Dwayne, you can change into a t-shirt and loose shorts. Use the washroom. I got out our notes and began to write the words on Rachel's thigh. At one point she winced. Sorry, Rachel, I said. All right. It will take a minute. I was just about done when Dwayne returned. Sit down here, Dwayne. Ready? No last second thoughts? He shook his head, but asked, I wonder how this thing could work. I mean, the differences between women and men are not just having boobs, I'm sorry grandma, I should say breasts and penises, and so on. There's a difference at the cellular level, right down to chromosomes too. Men have what the scientists call an XY pattern on a chromosome. Women are XX. If Rachel had babies she must have been completely changed to XX. How could that just happen? And women are smaller than men. Where does all the weight go? How the hell should I know? I snorted. It's magic! So it doesn't have to follow any scientific rules. But why ask me? I never went to college. Anyway, we're wasting time. Let's get started. I began to read the spell. Rachel held Wayne's hand. It was over in a minute. He looked at me apprehensively. Now what? We wait, I said, but I was getting worried when after three minutes nothing seemed to be happening, but then I saw him give a slight shiver. A minute later another shiver followed, then he began shivering continuously. In a few more minutes his teeth were chattering violently. I forced a cloth between his teeth. Then mercifully he fell unconscious. I had not felt anything, and Rachel seemed unaffected. I guess we had undergone all our changes, long ago. It's working, breathed Rachel we watched as the spell started its work. I had seen it before when Rachel changed, and now she too watched open mouth as his body convulsed under successive waves of change. Curious, I slid down his shorts to see his body better. At one point his skin even looked at if it was shimmering. I saw his features change, his body shrinking, changing proportions, his shoulders narrowing, then his waist constricting. His scrotum, then his penis shrank, disappearing under the pubic hair. I was concerned at first as he seemed to be only shrinking, then with relief I saw the hips widening, and two breasts beginning to bud on the chest, then slowly swelling to press out his t-shirt. As Dwayne writhed slightly, the legs opened, and in awe I saw the new-formed labia. 
At last the convulsions stopped and Duane lay before us unconscious. It had taken about six hours. I pulled up the shorts, covered the body with a blanket, and put a pillow under the head. I looked at Rachel. She looked drained. So that's what it was like, she said. You must have been really scared when I went through it. Yes, I was, but not only you. I was also changing, although I didn't react as violently as you did, or Duane. Are you sleepy? I'm not sure. I know I feel exhausted. Then why don't you go to bed? I'll watch him I should say her. I guess we have to get a new name for her now. I'll watch for about six hours, then you can take over. I watched the sleeping body for the next six hours or so. Dwayne was now fairly peaceful, apart from a few groans. I caught up on some sleep on the sofa. Around six I went to rouse Rachel. How is she? Rachel put an emphasis on the last word. She is fine, I think. Excuse me. I had to dab my eyes. The stress was getting to me. I had now lost my grandson. I hoped I would enjoy my new granddaughter. Oh, goodness, I'm tired. See you later. I climbed up the stairs to bed. In fact, I slept only fitfully. Stress, I guessed. Finally, early Tuesday morning, I struggled back downstairs. Rachel was watching the sleeping body. She looked at me, but shook her head. She's still sleeping, but I think she's fine. Coffee? I asked, trying unsuccessfully to suppress a yawn. No, thanks. I'm turning in again for some more shut-eye. There was not much to do. I wondered about taking her measurements for some clothes, but the effort of rolling a measuring tape under her was too much. It could wait anyway. Okay, see you in a couple of hours. Don't let me sleep any longer. There was nothing for me to do but watch and occasionally bathe her face. I tried to watch television but I could not concentrate. Then about midday I began to see a small flicker at her eyes. She now smelled rancid from perspiration, I supposed, so with a bit of a struggle, I eased off her clothes and gave her a sponge bath. I turned her onto her back. I marveled at the change. Dwayne was gone, replaced by a female figure that was both strange and yet slightly familiar. The male organs had disappeared, replaced completely by the familiar slit and folds of a woman. Her body was nicely rounded and smooth and the proportions of the figure too were totally different. She was quite slim, with nicely shaped breasts, wide hips and a slim waist. Her legs appeared long and shapely. Her hands and feet were now much smaller, but her fingers were long and shapely. There was still quite a lot of male hair on her chest and limbs, but I knew from Rachel's transformation, all those years ago, that that it would soon fall out. When I wiped her face an hour later she gave a groan, then the eyes opened. Just take it easy. You are all right. Want some water? I watched as she struggled to speak. Only guttural sounds came out. I remembered vividly how it had been with Rachel that first time. I let her sip some water. I feel funny, she croaked. Oh. She started suddenly and tried to rise, but I held her down. Shoo, just rest. You have had a rough time. Oh, I remember, she screwed up her eyes, you used a spell or something. Ah. Did it work? Yes, I think it worked. Am I all right? As far as I can see. How do I look? I'll show you in a minute. I tried to give her more water, but she had fallen asleep again. I was too groggy myself to think about cooking much, so I fixed myself a ham sandwich. Rachel came down an hour later. How is the patient now? She's having another sleep, I said, but it was not long before she was groaning again. This time her eyes stayed open, although unfocused. She gave a series of yawns and groans. I took her hand. Okay. I think it's now time you got moving a bit. We'll help you up. Rachel and I helped her to her feet and plumped her in a soft chair. Hungry? I asked. I'm not sure. Please, can I see myself? So, keen to see the new you? Better let me wash you first. I have bathed you already but to say you look a mess is being kind. Now, 
Hold still while I wipe your face. I held up a hand mirror to her. She gave a small scream. Her face registered shock at the shrill female tone. My voice. She peered in the mirror. Is that me? Well, pleased or not, I'm not sure. All that hair will go, won't it? Sure, in a day or so. I gave her some more water. She was getting her strength back quickly. More to eat? She shook her head. Later perhaps, but I feel sticky. Can I have a shower? Glad you mentioned it. You smell pretty sweaty. Yes, by all means, or how about that nice relaxing bath right now? I'll run it for you, said Rachel. Well, have you decided on a new name? I asked. You can't use Dwayne now. Something with a D? Dorothy? I shook my head. Too Wizard of Ozish, and I don't want it to remind me I might be a witch. Also, it might be shortened to dot. There are enough dot coms around. How about Diane? It's reminiscent of my past name. That sounds nice, but would you be happy with it? I think so. I'll see how I like it, and if I don't, I'll change it. Bath's ready. I heard Rachel yell. Okay, Diane it is. Now let me support you. She was not heavy, maybe a hundred and ten pounds or so, but she moved awkwardly. I remembered how Rachel had been uncoordinated in her new body. Careful! I warned. It will be awkward for a bit. You are not used to your new body. Your legs have a different set to your hips. Your hips are wider too and your legs are proportionately longer. Watch your chest too. You now have breasts, and it hurts if you bang them. I lowered her slowly into the bath. Rachel had added some of my scented oil to it. Hey, that oil's expensive stuff. I complained, and you've added so much it smells like a brothel in here. And just what would you know about brothels? Grinned Rachel. I thought you were a respectable grandmother. Yes, a pillar of the church, that's me, and using magic spells. But it's for a good cause. I pointed to Rachel's thigh. She was still wearing her shorts and the words of the spell showed on her thigh. What about that? Are we ever going to need it again? No, let's put an end to it. Wash that off, and I'll burn the paper downstairs. Rachel, I said, this is now Diane. She wants to use that name. Rachel kissed her. Welcome, Diane, to the wonderful world of women. Now lie back. I'll wash you. First, your hair. Diane wanted to wash herself, but we persuaded her to lie still while we did it. I smiled at her encouragingly and held her while Rachel sponged her chest carefully, over and under her new breasts, and in her cleavage, gently stripping off the male hair, still clinging to her. It slowly stripped off her legs and arms too. She tried to cover herself. Don't be shy, I said. You're a woman now, and there are only women here. What about down there? I pointed to her pubis. I'll do that, she said hastily. Then I saw the shock as her exploring fingers found her new anatomy. I was not sure how coordinated she was yet, but the sooner she got used to the more intimate parts of her body, the better. I handed her the soap and a cloth. She gave a small cry of wonder as her male hair stripped off, leaving her with a small neat roundish patch. Deja vu all over again, grinned Rachel. She must have been remembering her own experiences. When I washed Diane's arms and chest I noticed some of the coarse male hair was already beginning to pull away. I'm sorry, I said, as she winced once, but it has to come off. Now, let me brush your hair. I stroked it carefully under a hair dryer. At last she was done, looking rosy from our attentions. Now you can take a look, but ignore any hair around your jaw and upper lip, and on your chest. It will all fall out in a day or so. Oh. I almost forgot, I said. It will look better tomorrow when we are shopping. I fetched my razor. Your underarms. Most women shave there. You may need to shave your legs too, but not right away. Hold still and I'll do under your arms. I lathered her and stripped off the hair. I looked at Diane's face, 
there were still one or two obstinate male hairs around her lips, but they were fair and hardly noticeable, and I knew she would lose them by the next day. Right, I said, now you can get a proper look at yourself. You're a bit cleaner and you've lost most of your male hair. I helped her to stand at the mirror. Her jaw dropped. Then I saw her almost flushing. Why, I'm, it's. I, uh, I'm pretty. She stood straighter and lifted her chin, then turned her head one way and then the other, lifting her chest and turning to look at her rear. She clasped her narrow waist and even stood on tiptoes. Her hands went to her breasts, testing the texture. They feel so strange, soft, yet firm, yet sensitive too. They're gorgeous, she breathed. How about your nipples? Rachel said. Pinch them I saw Diane start, then begin to blush. I had no idea, she giggled. You like what you see in the mirror? I asked. Yes, but is my butt not too big? She arched her back to try to look at it. No, not at all. Remember you're a woman now. Women have bigger butts than men. You're just not used to it. I noticed her yawning again and her eyes were losing focus. Come to think of it, so were Rachel and I, all right I said, I think we're all pooped. Bedtime for all of us, then we'll make our plans tomorrow. We all slept well. I know I was still exhausted, but I awoke refreshed at seven the next morning. Rachel was up soon after, but Diane slept until one. After lunch we sat down at the table to go over our plans. Diane was wearing one of my house goats. Okay, Diane, I said, as we talked about earlier, your biggest problem to begin with is clothes for you. Your pants now don't really fit at all. Even if you shortened the legs they would not look right. Same with some of your other clothes, but when we are over at the motel, Rachel and I can go over your stuff and decide what you can still use. I'll loan you a pair of panties and a drawstring skirt I have, a blouse and sweater too. I am bigger than you in the bust so none of my bras would fit you. You'll just have to go braless until we get you one. I'll give you a pair of flat shoes of mine. Okay, we should get going first thing tomorrow when the mall opens. There's two big stores, and a bunch of specialty stores so that should give us enough of a selection. Rachel looked at us in turn. I've been thinking about this. I wonder if it's such a good idea to use some of Dwayne's clothes for Diane? Well, we might as well use them for casual wear, and it would be a pity to send them to charity. Rachel shook her head. Still the same old thrifty Ellen. No, if Diane has gone through the trauma of her change, not to mention all the effort it has cost us, she might as well go the whole way, for two reasons. I think she should make a complete break with her past and get women's clothes, really feminine clothes. It will keep her new female identity very much in her mind and help her to start carrying herself like a woman, her posture, walking and sitting down and things like that. You know as well as I do that a woman has to be a lot more careful sitting down when she is wearing a skirt than when she's wearing pants. The sooner Diane gets used to it the better. And the other thing, just in case, we don't want Sarah or any of the rest of the family recognizing Dwayne's clothes, but worn by some strange woman. What about money? asked Diane. I think your credit card will be okay still. Diane is similar enough to Dwayne if you scribble it. Even better still, just sign your name with a D, but you should call the credit card companies and get new cards in the name of Diane. Anyway, enough for today. I'm to collect Roy at the airport. Are you up to getting back to your motel now? She tried stretching, but groaned slightly. Yes, I think so. I'll call a cab. I shook my head. Maybe I should drive you there, on my way to the airport, I said. I tucked her into bed at the motel. She was wearing one of Duane's shirts. I looked at it, then her. Yes, Rachel was right. The sooner we got her a nightdress the better. All right, see you tomorrow morning. We can have some breakfast at some fast food place. I saw Rachel turn up her nose. Do we have to? Oh well, I suppose it will do. I met Roy at the airport as planned. He looked glad to be home. I thought he looked tired, but he said he had a good time at the convention. Rachel's still with us, I said. 
she's having a good visit, seeing all her old haunts. Oh, by the way, there's a friend of hers in town too. She's called Diane. We're meeting her tomorrow for some breakfast and some shopping. In fact, we will make a day of it. As I thought, Roy did not inquire any more. I got a slight shock when I saw Diane dressed and waiting for us in the motel lobby the next morning. She was recovering well, but I looked at her in dismay. I shook my head. Back up to your room, Mississippi. We have things to do. Make up, tidy up your clothes. You just look sloppy. I said when we were in the privacy of her room. First, let me see your wig. I straightened it and tucked some stray hairs under it. Now, a little makeup. It's too early in the day for the full works, but you definitely need a little lipstick. I pulled out my compact and selected one. Purse your lips. There, a light dab. Yes, that's better. Now your blouse. Even that needed straightening and I smoothed her skirt. I felt the ridges of her panties underneath. That's a little better, but you still look like a waif. Then I noticed her face. Oh, I'm sorry Diane, that was tactless of me, but now that you are a woman, you should be more careful with your appearance. People will judge you on it, especially other women. Breakfast was fine. Rachel and I ate lightly, just a coffee, juice and Danish each. Diane ordered pancakes and coffee. I guessed she was just about fully recovered. I was glad she was getting her appetite back, but she ate too much like a man. I would have to teach her to eat more like a woman but that would have to wait. We had more pressing matters. I looked at my watch. It was close to ten. All right, we'd better get going. Diane, you ready for shopping? I watched her as she moved. She seemed confident and eager even the way she got out of the car at the mall. What a contrast to Rachel's first time out. She had been so nervous. Where first, said Diane. There's a big store at the corner there. We'll start with your lingerie, I think, bras and panties. The panties were no problem. Diane was hesitating so I quickly grabbed a couple of packs of five in a medium size and a floral patterned light cotton and tossed them to Rachel, who had picked up a basket. She looked at them and turned up her nose. She removed one pack and replaced it on the shelf, then, grinning at me, remember what I said, she picked up a pack of satin ones. You like these, Diane? I saw a faint blush on Diane's cheeks. I shrugged. Yes, I suppose satin ones were even more feminine. That will do to begin, Diane, two nice basic sets of panties. When you are doing your own shopping later you can get other styles, as you want. Maybe even thongs, if that's your fancy. I had the satisfaction of seeing her blush, beat red this time. Now bras. You'd better get these fitted by the assistant. Nothing worse than a bra that doesn't fit right. Most are underwire styles now and you don't want wires sticking in you. Diane suddenly froze. She pointed over to an assistant. That girl, she was in my class at high school. She'll know who I am. No, she won't, and don't point. I grabbed Diane's arm and led her to the assistant, ignoring her trembling. Go on, I whispered, but Diane was too tongue-tied. Miss, this is my granddaughter, I finally persuaded her to start wearing a bra, I said jocularly. She'll need measured, so can you fit her for some, fairly basic ones? Friend of back closure? asked the assistant. She looked at us skeptically. I suppose it must have been unusual for a grandmother to take a young woman for bra shopping, but at least, as I had figured, she showed no sign of recognition. Diane began to stutter so I broke in, back closure. The assistant began a faint smile at the corners of her mouth, but she only said, certainly. Can you come this way, miss? The fitting room is over here. Diane gave me a panic-stricken look, but I glared at her and pointed firmly to the fitting room. Rachel and I watched as they disappeared through a door. While we waited we idly walked around the lingerie section and I picked up a couple of half-slips and two cotton nightdresses. Then I thought of what we had discussed earlier. I put one of the cotton ones back and selected another in a pale blue filmy nylon. 
What about a garter belt? Giggled Rachel, pulling a lacy style from a rack. I shrugged. I don't know. She'll have to decide on her own lifestyle, whether she wants to wear stockings or pantyhose, or nothing. Rachel was now examining a white Mary widow. She held it against herself, the garters dangling down the front of her smart blue skirt. Now it was my turn to giggle. That would give her a nice slim waist, but just look at all these hooks in the back. Maybe if she sees that she'll decide she only wants to wear pants so I'd leave it. Rachel's eyes twinkled. Oh. I don't know, Ellen. That corset might give a wonderful boost to some girls, morale. Seeing a pretty woman in it will give a man a wonderful boost somewhere, as well. Rachel pretended to be shocked. Oh my goodness. Listen to you. Still, I wonder how long it will take her to start trying out her new body. For sex, I mean? I had been wondering that too. Rachel was now fingering through some control panties. I shook my head. You can leave these too, I said. She doesn't need them. She's quite slim and her tummy is fairly flat. I saw Rachel staring behind me and I turned. It was Diane, the assistant just behind her. She was looking slightly flushed, but otherwise she looked great. She even seemed to be holding her chest out more. Like it, she said, beaming. We nodded vigorously. What a difference! I said. Yes, there's nothing like a good fitting bra. How does it feel? Strange, confining, yet comfortable. I looked at her carefully. Her breasts looked quite pert. Turn around. Yes, she looks very nice, doesn't she, Rachel? Rachel gave a wistful smile. Yes, it makes me remember my first time. Remember, you went shopping for me. Okay, Diane, I said. If you are happy with that one get two more in the same style, one in black, and try on one with wider straps too. You may need it for some dresses or tops. You do look nice, I complimented when they returned again. You're wearing one of them too. That's good. Now, I think that will do to begin with. Hand me all your stuff and I'll pay for it. Don't argue. Diane watched as I paid for her purchases. Thanks, Grandma, but why did you want to pay for them? She asked as we were leaving the lingerie section. If that girl was in your class, she might have checked your credit card and wondered about your name. Oh, I see. Thanks very much. I'll pay you back. No, this time just look on it as a gift from a grandmother to her new granddaughter. Now, Diane, you have panties, but have you thought about what else? Are you going to wear a skirt or pants, and if a skirt, pantyhose or stockings with it? What do you think? Rachel and I think skirts or dresses are a better idea for you. Get you used to female clothing. You will have to be more careful when you are sitting down, but that will make you look more graceful, more feminine. Personally, I prefer skirts and dresses, but I know some women find pants are more practical. It will depend on your lifestyle, and on your job too. Remember, Rachel and I are in our 60s, grandmothers. We're maybe not as concerned with fashion as younger women would be. So why not get two skirts and one pair of pants, and maybe a pair of jeans for casual wear? But my main reason for asking was, if you wear skirts, you'll have to decide on stockings, pantyhose, or none at all. In the summer you probably want to go barelegged. You know, said Rachel, when I first changed, there were a lot of things that were unacceptable then, but they are almost blasé now. At first, I wore open girdles and stockings with skirts. So did Ellen. So did most women. It was the usual women's dress then. Then they brought in panty girdles. God, they were hot. Then pantyhose came on the scene. Now it's mainly pants with various parts of your anatomy showing. There were bras, push-up bras, no bras, bustiers, now even back to corsets. Cleavage rules again. Now I just laugh quietly at them all and wonder how long it will take until things change yet again. I just stick with styles I like. Quite a speech, Rachel, I teased. She stuck her tongue out at me. We looked at Diane. Well, maybe I'll try wearing skirts. Yes, 
a good idea, said Rachel. Another thing, if you are with a boy and feeling romantically inclined, a skirt is more practical. I gave her a glare but she gave me an innocent smile then stuck her tongue out at me again. Diane turned white, then pink. All right, Diane, next on your list. As most women wear pantyhose with their skirts or dresses maybe you should start with getting several pair. Stockings with a garter belt are another alternative. Most women don't wear them now but men like them. I suppose they think they're sexy but maybe you should reserve them for that special man. She blushed yet again. So we got several pairs of pantyhose in the hosiery section, and, moving along to other departments, two pretty skirts, just above knee height, and a longer one, along with a pair of black pants and a pair of women's levis. By this time I was feeling my feet. Besides, I was having my usual morning coffee pangs and I suggested we take a break. Fortunately there was a Starbucks nearby. What next? asked Diane. Now for your top half. You should get a blouse or two. You can't go wrong with them, then some t-shirts in a woman's style and a light sweater, maybe a heavier one as well. Oh yes, a couple of dresses too. Then, you'll need a basic casual jacket and coat or two. I think you'd better keep a low profile while you get used to your new body, so you don't need anything fancy to start with. No ball gowns, then, said Diane. She was smiling. I was so happy to see her in a good mood. It was at least another two hours before we were done with these. Diane was now wearing some of her new purchases, a light sweater with a skirt and pantyhose. She looked great, if a bit self-conscious. We headed to a nearby restaurant for a late lunch. Now what? she asked as she swallowed the last of her coffee. I looked at her. Shoes now, and then some makeup and toiletries. I know a good shoe store. It's in a small strip mall just across the street from this one. I think you need a pair or two of casual flat shoes, some runners, and a more dressy pair, maybe pumps in black, with heels. The assistant was very friendly so I let Diane do the fitting herself while Rachel and I wandered around the store. I examined some winter boots. Diane would be needing them soon if she stayed here. I grinned as I watched her walking in front of the mirror. She was trying a pair of shoes with two-inch heels. At first she was awkward, to say the least, but I saw the swing of her skirt and the sway of her hips as she got the hang of it. Yes, she would do fine. You look good. I said. Now you'll need a purse to match. Yes, that's a nuisance of being a woman. Men can stuff all their gear in their pockets, but women carry more in any way they don't want pockets spoiling the lines of their clothes. I sorted through some on a shelf. How about that one? It's in a mock leather. It should match most of your clothes. Now when you've paid for this, I want you to come next door. Just keep these shoes on. I saw a sudden beam of pleasure on her face. What's so good? I asked. It's my new shoes. It's just that I'm hearing my heels click on the floor. It's such a feminine sound. I looked at her feet. She was wearing two-inch heels. She had pretty ankles, with a woman's small feet. I felt very pleased with my granddaughter. Next door was a beauty salon I used. Not that I was too regular a visitor, as grandmothers in their 60s don't usually have stylish makeup at the top of their agendas, but I usually got my hair cut and styled there. I was greeted like an old friend. Hi, Mrs. Van Vliet, said the assistant Doreen, what can we do for you today? Doreen, I said, I want you to meet my cousin Rachel, visiting from Arizona, and this is her friend Diane, also visiting. Diane has a dinner later tonight and she needs a bit of help with her makeup. Doreen gave Diane an appraising survey. How about her hair? Does she need it styled? I could have kicked myself. Of course Doreen would notice the wig. I had to think fast. Well no, I said conspiratorially, lowering my voice, actually she's wearing a wig. One of her friends had some chemotherapy some months ago and lost her hair. Diane and some other girls had their hair cut off in sympathy so she wouldn't feel so bad, but Diane wants to look better at this dinner so she decided to wear a wig. Oh, Mrs. Van Vliet, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. 
That's all right, Doreen, so just help her with some makeup. Maybe you can suggest some products and colors for her. Doreen looked at Diane carefully. Gee, Diane, you're so lucky. You really have a nice skin, and your features are so nice too. We won't need to disguise anything. But what a pity about your hair. Diane was blushing furiously, but she allowed herself to be led to a chair. Rachel and I watched, making occasional suggestions. Doreen was truly amazing. With only a light application of makeup, she had Diane transformed. Diane was already pretty, but now she was a real beauty. The whole process took about an hour. Doreen had suggested three lipsticks, mascara, eyeliner and a shadow, and a light powder and blusher. Doreen also shaped her nails and applied a red polish. Last thing. Diane, I said quietly while Doreen was back in the storeroom, you've had one ear pierced. You better get the other to match. Ask her yourself. Doreen, said Diane. Can you pierce my ear as well? I've one done already. One, asked Doreen, why only one? Uh, I had it done in high school, but I fainted when only one was done, and I never got around to having the other done. Now I think I am a bit braver. Are you sure? asked Doreen. I don't want you fainting here. That's all right, I broke in. I'm sure she will be all right. I winced as Diane gave a small cry, but she left the store with a pair of small gold balls in her ears. Let me see you, I said. She tilted her head to show me her ears. Yes, very pretty, but remember, I warned, make sure you do the alcohol treatment with it. We were walking back through the mall to get our car when I heard a cry. Mom. I turned to see Sarah and Henry waving at us across the concourse. A shock ran through me, but we had been spotted and there was nowhere to hide. Diane was trembling and had gone white. Okay, steady, I whispered to her. I gripped her arm. Remember, you re not supposed to know them. I know, say you are a friend of Rachel's from Arizona. Hi mom, fancy meeting you here. Doing some shopping? Sarah was looking interestedly at Rachel and Diane. She had not recognized either. I jumped in. Sarah, you remember my cousin Rachel from Arizona? This is a friend of hers, Diane, Diane's story. She was on her way through and gave us a call. I saw Diane's hands trembling. Glad to meet you again, Rachel, boomed Henry. I think we last met, oh, twenty years ago, before you moved. He turned his attention to Diane. Glad to meet you, Mississippi Diane's your name? Diane was white-faced, but bravely shook their hands. Ah, uh, we were just showing Diane around, said Rachel. My, how things have changed since Bill and I left. We even went past where the old bookstore was, the one that we, or at least Ellen owned. We indulged in small talk for a minute or two. I wanted to get away. Diane was trying to put on a good face, but she looked positively ill. Well, Ellen, said Henry, we'd better get on and finish our shopping. See you next Sunday, then. Sunday? I gasped. What's going on, then? Mom? Don't say you've you forgotten, said Sarah accusingly. It's Thanksgiving. You and Dad were going to spend it with us this year. Oh yes, of course, I said. I felt polaxed. I had forgotten completely, being so busy with Rachel and Diane. Say, said Sarah, there's always room at the table, and Thanksgiving is a time for sharing. Why don't Rachel and Diane come along as well? Diane was too much in shock to say much. That okay with you ladies? We don't want to put you out, protested Rachel feebly. Diane looked as if she was going to faint. But surely, Sarah, that's too much of an imposition on you, I tried. No, not at all. Glad to have you all, Sarah laughed. Fine then. See you Sunday, laughed Henry. The two older boys will be at their fiancés anyway, but my youngest boy, he bit his lip. Yes, my youngest boy, that's Frank. He will be there. I'm sure he will be glad to see a good-looking gal like Diane. Anyway, got to go. I have a meeting tonight. With a wave they were off. 
I see that inwardly at Henry now referring to Frank as his youngest. It was as if he had put the very existence of Duane from his mind. I looked at Rachel and Diane in dismay. I need a drink, I said. This is a real mess. Let's get home. We have some major planning to do. What about Roy? asked Rachel. Won't he be back home now? No, his plane only gets in at nine. Why did you choose story for my surname? asked Diane. I guess I was thinking of a story to tell your mother and father, so the name story just came to mind. All right, I said, sitting on my couch and sipping my second glass of bourbon. Let's get our story straight. We have to fool all of them Sarah, Henry, and Frank. Let's think. I know. Rachel, you are visiting me, just for a holiday. Diane, you live in Arizona. You knew Rachel there, but you have been visiting friends in New York, and now you are taking a few days stop over here so Rachel and I can show you around. You can say that it's a brief trip before you decide on what to do. You are thinking of maybe of college but you may take a year waitressing or something to earn some money. Say that your father died year ago and you live with your mom. Now, you will need an excuse to deflect Frank's attention. He should be attracted to a good-looking girl like you, so I think you let it be known, fairly early on, that you have a steady boyfriend back in Arizona. Another thing, Diane, your grandpa Roy. He hasn't met you, as Diane, I mean. As far as he knows, Dwayne still exists, but has been banished from the family. So be on your toes. Don't let anything slip to him either. And make sure you don't act familiar with Sarah's house. You know, ask the way to the washroom if you need to go, and admire the decor in the house as if you were seeing it for the first time. You know your mother fancies her decorating taste. Unfortunately, Diane, you will need to get some more clothes. Those you already got are not quite right for the occasion. You'll need a kind of casual dress or something more suitable for Thanksgiving. But we can get that tomorrow. I've had enough shopping for the day. You know, said Rachel. Diane, you are unattached here and it's not as if you have a family other than Ellen. The sooner you leave here the better. Why don't you come out to Arizona with me? Get a fresh start. You can live with me at first. Hell, you can live with me as long as you want or until we get into each other's hair. Diane nodded. That's very good of you, Rachel. Yes, maybe the sooner I get away from this city the better. The sooner you get away from this house the better. I said. Roy will be back soon. I'll take you to the Hickory, and then get to the airport. For Thanksgiving we had arranged that Roy would drive all of us to Sarah's. I climbed into the front beside Roy while Rachel sat in the back. Okay Roy, I said, don't forget Rachel's friend Diane. She's staying at the Hickory Motor Hotel on night drive. I tried to quell my thumping heart as we drove up. Diane was waiting for us. She looked quite smart this time. She really was coming along fine. She was wearing a black belted three-quarter sleeve sweater and a reddish skirt that we had got at Penny's the previous day, with dark hose and black boots with high heels. Maybe her rear stuck out a bit, to my fashion taste, but it emphasized her small waist. For jewelry she had a gold-colored chain and small hoop earrings she had borrowed from Rachel, and a gold-colored lady's watch she had bought when we were out. She had put on makeup again, quite expertly now, I thought, lipstick with tasteful amounts of blusher, eyeliner, and a touch of eyeshadow. I got the whiff of the Givenchy fragrance I had bought her. It suited her very well. I watched Roy out of the corner of my eye. I could tell he was taken by Diane. I supposed any man would be. She really was very pretty. No one would have recognized that she had been Duane. Even so, she was twitching nervously as we drove into Henry and Sarah's driveway. I saw Rachel give her hand a comforting squeeze. It went better than I would have dreamed. The only ones who weren't nervous at the outset were Roy, Sarah, Henry and Frank, but as the evening went on, we all gradually relaxed. Then I almost had a fit when we were sitting down after dinner, Diane was sitting on a low sofa and her skirt had ridden up slightly, then, as she absent-mindedly crossed her legs, I saw a brief flash of a dark stocking top and a white thigh. She was wearing stockings, not pantyhose. Oh God, 
so she's probably wearing a garter belt as well, I thought. I think Frank had noticed the stockings too, and I saw him staring at her legs, but at least he did no more. No one else seemed to have noticed. As Diane relaxed she began to contribute more to the conversation. In fact, it seemed Sarah was taken with her. When we said goodnight Sarah even included Diane in her round of hugs. We dropped her off at the motel. Okay, see you tomorrow again, Diane, I said. What's on with you ladies tomorrow, said Roy. Oh, just showing Diane around a bit more. Maybe take in a museum or art gallery, and wander around the shops, I said innocently. We had arranged to meet Diane at the motel again. This time she was wearing a black skirt with a blue sweater and a light woolen jacket. It was getting cooler. She was wearing makeup again and had combed her wig slightly differently. You look good, I said. So what do you want to do today? By the way, you gave me a shock yesterday. You were wearing stockings, weren't you? I thought you were going to wear pantyhose. When did you get the stockings? Well, I was thinking about what you said, and if a garter belt and stockings are so feminine, I thought I would try them, as the more I accustomed myself to them the better. I got them while you were at the washroom in the mall a couple of days ago. There was a Victoria's Secret just across the way. No trouble fixing your garters? Rachel grinned. I met someone in Palm Springs. He liked wearing women's clothes, and I knew how they worked. Well, yes, I guess the back ones were awkward. And how do you find wearing stockings? I asked very strange at the beginning, cooler than pantyhose, and a slight feeling of vulnerability with them and the skirt. But I think I like it. I feel more sexy. Actually, I'm wearing stockings again today. Want to see? She began to hike up her skirt. No, I almost shouted, behave yourself. This is a motel lounge, I whispered. I take it you enjoy women's clothing then? Yes, I really do. You know, women's clothing was strange at first, that smooth feel of my stockings, slip and panties. They're more slippery than men's clothing, and they cling to your body more. It was strange wearing a bra too. It's a bit like a harness, but I like its nice firm feeling, and the outline it gives me. I like the feeling of my skirt as it swings round my legs and thighs, and you know, Grandma, she said, just being a woman really gives me a good feeling. Rachel and I hugged her. Okay, what do we do today? I asked. How about something cultural, said Rachel, as we told Roy. This time we went to an art gallery, but it was really wasted on me. Anything I liked was at least a hundred years old, and there was not much of that. I was only too glad to get to a small restaurant and have some lunch. There were a group of businessmen, I supposed, at a nearby table. I saw them look at Diane approvingly. I hoped she was keeping her skirt well down. You know, said Rachel, it's about time I got back home to Arizona. I'm beginning to miss my own place, and I have a couple of grandkids supposed to visit next weekend. And I must get ready for Christmas. So, if you are going with me Diane, you should make sure you have everything ready for moving. Just about just about everything I own now is in a couple of cases in the motel, said Diane, but I've been thinking, I think I am doing fine now, and I'm used to the city here. If it's all the same with you I think I'd rather stay here. I'm sure no one would recognize me now. Well, I said, then you will need to get another apartment, and a new car. I'll help you look for a place, and maybe I can get Roy to go car hunting with you. I was in two minds whether I wanted Diane to stay or not. I wanted to look after her and protect her, but I knew she would be better in an entirely new city. I watched Diane closely over the next week or so after Rachel left, and it seemed to me she still needed a bit more familiarization as a woman. She was improving but still didn't carry herself quite like a woman, and used many women's mannerisms. I knew she hadn't had experience of all the things girls do, playing with dolls, pajama parties, learning to use makeup, first dating, pretty dresses and so on, but I saw she was still unfamiliar in chatting with women, or reading other women's moods, or men's for that matter, the way women do. She had now moved into an apartment, but she still didn't have a job. 
She would need one soon, as she was running out of the money I had loaned her. I got to thinking of ways I could help her. Then I had a brainwave, I thought. I spoke to a hotel owner I knew about putting her on staff. The holiday season was approaching fast and they would be busy with a lot of parties. They could treat her as a trainee so she would work in the kitchen, as a waitress, on the cleaning staff, the front desk and so on. It would be hectic, but she would meet many other girls and get confidence in handling herself. It turned out really well. Sure, she complained of the work, but I saw her mannerisms change by the week until she was just like any regular young woman. The only time I heard her complain was when she had her first period. She said she had a backache and felt generally uncomfortable, but she accepted that she would have to get used to her monthlies. Christmas was awkward too. I would have loved to see more of her, but there was so much going on with the rest of my family that I had no time for her. Diane was still busy at the hotel, but I felt guilty, as I knew she would feel lonely. Finally, just before New Year's, I was able to meet her for supper, just after work. I noticed she was looking pleased with herself. So what's the good news? I asked. You look as if something nice has happened. I've met a photographer at the hotel. There was a big party there for one of the city corporations and he was taking some pictures. I was waitressing in the lounge and he came up to me. Eventually he gave me his card. He said he had been looking at me and he wants to take some pictures of me. He thinks I could be a model. You're not as skinny or as tall as a model should be. I said. I can't see you prancing down a runway. No, he doesn't mean that type. It would be for commercial products. You know, using a pretty girl to sell things. Well, be careful. I did not want her to do it, but she seemed so excited that I kept my mouth shut. That's nice, honey. I said. When does he want to take the pictures? In a few days, just after the holiday season is over. Oh, do you mind if I come along with you? Just to check him out. Sure, okay. Well, maybe I'd better check. Excuse me. She went off to a nearby telephone. She nodded her head when she came back. Yes, she said, that's all right with him. Next Wednesday night at 7, if that's okay for you. Do you mind driving? The photographer's studio was on a side street. I looked in the window as we entered. His work seemed quite domestic and tasteful, a lot of personal photographs, individuals, couples, families, wedding parties. I felt reassured. We were welcomed by the photographer. He seemed okay and shook my hand when Diane introduced us. His name was Jim Driscoll. What I want to do is to take a number of pictures, he said. Diane has had no training as a model, but I think she is pretty enough and carries herself well. I want to take a few to assess her potential. Jim had Diane strike a few poses, then he had her move around, trying various gestures while he took what seemed like a very large number of shots. Then it was over. He wished us good night and we drove off. What did you think? asked Diane. Actually, I was a bit let down. I thought there would be more to it than that. And what there was seemed a bit boring. What do you think of Jim? she asked. He seems all right. In fact, I liked him quite a bit. He has an easy manner. He's not married, is he? I noticed he was not wearing a wedding ring. No, I am sure he is not married. Grandma, he has asked me out for dinner. Do you like him? He seems nice, I said cautiously. Enjoy yourself. Diane gave me a call the next day. Jim has printed up some pictures. Do you want to go with me and see them? Sure. That sounds like fun. By the way, how was your dinner with Jim? Great. We went to a nice restaurant. I had a good time. I guess that's my first date, she laughed. It was nice to hear her laugh. So are you happy with your life after your change? Oh, definitely, yes. I'm getting to enjoy it more all the time. I'm having fun. I was a bit shy about it first, but I know men look at me as I pass. I see men looking at me all the time. It's nice having them pay attention to me. They're different men then, 
before my change. It gives me a feeling of power that my face and body can have the effect to attract men, she giggled. It's even fun to tease men a little with my appearance, and you know, just brush against them. Small danger signals came to the back of my mind. That's okay, but be careful. Too much and you get a reputation as a flirt or a tease, and that can attract the wrong sort of men. I wanted to ask more about her date but I figured she would tell me when she wanted to. The next evening I accompanied her to the office. Jim laid out his work on the table. I thought you took a lot more pictures than that, asked Diane. Oh yes. In fact, these are only about quarter of the lot. I just kept the best. I looked at them carefully. Indeed, they were very nice. Diane was really a pretty girl and he had some good poses of her. He really seemed to have captured her essence. She certainly looked as good as some models in the department store catalogs. Do you like them? He asked. Diane's eyes were shining. Yes, very much. Don't I look great? Jim looked at her critically. Yes, I think there's a lot of potential there, but I think it would be better if you changed your hairstyle a bit. I'd like to try some shots with your hair drawn back away from your brow. I saw Diane begin to blush. I'm sorry, Jim, I can't. Not for a bit anyway. You see, it's a wig. I had my hair cut short some months ago. It's coming along fine now, but it will be six months or so before I can get rid of the wig. Jim gave a grimace of annoyance. Oh well, we'll just have to live with that, or maybe you can try different wigs. Now, I'd like to get some more shots. Can you come tomorrow night? That okay with you? Diane looked at me. Sorry, Diane, I am going out with Roy, but why don't you go on your own? You don't need me. I felt I could trust Jim. A week later Diane called me again. I got some of the new pictures from Jim. Do you want to see them? Sure. Do you want me to come over? I knew that at some point she would have to meet Roy again, and then we would have to make up some story why she had not returned to her supposed house in Arizona. She laid the proofs out on her kitchen table. Jim had her in various poses, as if she was showing off her clothes. This lot were even better than the previous ones, but I had a start when I saw the style of some of them. Not that her nipples or even much of her breasts were showing, but Diane was naked from the waist up. In one she had her back to the camera, glancing provocatively over her shoulder. In another her arms were discreetly folded over her breasts, showing a bit of her cleavage. In another she was pretending to unhook a black lacy bra. I looked at her squarely. Diane, these are a bit suggestive. Are you all right with these? She blushed slightly. Yes, I think so. There was another woman there anyway. He said it was his sister. Oh well, I thought. She is pretty enough, and I suppose the pictures are tasteful enough. I had seen some just as risque in some women's magazines, and I thought no more about it. I saw Diane on and off the next month. She told me she had started dating Jim regularly. I liked him and I was happy for her. One day there was a real sparkle in her eyes. She showed me a photo album. Grandma, see these. Aren't they great? It's for a show on gowns by one of the big stores in town. They really were eye-catching. Diane and another two girls were modeling ball gowns and wedding dresses. One, in which she was modeling an emerald green ball gown, was little short of stunning. They're so nice, honey, I said. You look so nice, I should say. You like modeling these? Yes, I do. They make me feel so feminine and glamorous. You know, that gown was made of real silk. It felt so luxurious on my skin. I loved its rustle and feel. You know, Grandma, I feel so fulfilled now. Before my change I felt so confined. Now it's just wonderful, all the nice clothes I can wear, and people admiring me. I only wish I could do more. I'm still working at the hotel, but as I get better known I should be able to make enough just by modeling. You still seeing Jim? Yes, Grandma, I see him a lot. She started to blush slightly, and I noticed a small smile at the corner of her mouth. I looked at her steadily. 
She must have seen my eyes twinkling, and she nodded. Yes, Jim and I are lovers. In fact, we have been sleeping together the last week. When I was her age I had made sure I had Roy's engagement ring before we made love, but I knew these were different times. I held her and kissed her. You're really happy about it? Yes, so much, she beamed. I felt both happy for her, and to be honest, relieved that my efforts had worked out so well. Then one evening a month later I was in Diane's part of the city at a church women's meeting, and, feeling like some company, and as I hadn't seen her for some time, I called her on my cell phone and invited myself up. She welcomed me and gave me a big hug. She seemed pleased with herself. We chatted a few minutes then she went to put on some coffee. I had to go to the washroom, then as I came back through the living room I looked around to see what she had done to decorate her apartment. It was still fairly sparsely furnished, but she had some new framed prints on the wall, and I noticed a new rug on the floor. She had some nice knick-knacks on a shelf and a pretty wall hanging. I noticed a large photo album on a shelf, and idly I began to flick though it. It was a portfolio of her pictures. The first were some that I had seen earlier, but as I turned the pages there were new ones. These became more revealing, not just cleavage, but then nipples and the full breasts, until she was completely nude. The last page was even worse. She was posed squarely in front of the camera, wearing a black garter belt and stockings, and nothing else, her legs slightly opened. I shut the book trembling. I did not know what to say. Like a cookie with your coffee? I heard her call from the kitchen. Yes, please, I managed to croak. She brought through a tray with our coffee and some cookies, but her smile vanished when she saw me with the album. That's my portfolio. Don't you think they're good? She said hopefully. That depends, I said carefully. Diane, maybe it's none of my business, but just be careful what you are getting into. No, hell, it is my business. I snapped. I helped you get your new body. You're now my granddaughter, and I know you can't discuss it with your parents, so I have a right to be concerned about you and protect you. I suppose you are being paid for this stuff. I slapped open at the album where she had exposed herself. I had the satisfaction of seeing her face go white. I won't call you a whore, but you are very close to it. Why do you do it? She was now coloring slightly, in anger. Yes, you helped me but it's my body now, my life. The reasons? I'm proud of my new body. I want to show it off and I'll think not to insult me. I'm not a whore. I'm only letting them take pictures of me. Not that I don't know that that most men would like to get into my panties. The money is good. I shook my head and pointed to the pose. I can't believe Jim would take pictures like that. It's not Jim's work. Another photographer saw my pictures and liked them. I'm modeling for him now. And what does Jim say about this? I haven't told him. Don't you think you should? Actually, Grandma, I'm no longer seeing Jim at all. We had a fight. I was very disappointed. Oh, well, anyway. You should be careful. I am being careful. I just wish you would keep out of my affairs. If I had kept out of your affairs you would still be Duane, I shouted. All mixed up. Maybe you would have killed yourself. Just leave me alone. I remember, before I helped you, that you said you just wanted an ordinary life as a woman, with ordinary children and so on. This is a fine way of going about it. Diane held her head in her hands. Just leave me alone, I said, she screamed. I was so angry I did not know what to think. I stumbled out of the door. I was furious all the rest of that week. It took all of my efforts not to show it to Roy. Then I began to weaken and have second thoughts. Diane needed all the support I could give her. I was almost set to call her when a large part of my world fell apart. I had been tidying the house when the doorbell rang. It was a policeman. He said that Roy had been taken ill at the club and was in hospital. In a cold panic I called Sarah, who rushed with me to hospital. Roy was in intensive care, unconscious from a stroke, and he died that night. He was gone, and I hadn't had a chance even to say goodbye. 
My family all rallied around me in the next few terrible days. I was very grateful for their love and support. Actually, Henry was of great support as well. The memorial service was very nice. I saw a great many of my friends there, but all of it barely made up the great hole in my heart. Sarah made me stay with her the first week, but by then I had had enough of Henry and I returned home. Ruth came to stay with me another few days. Gradually coming out of my own feeling of devastation, it was some weeks before I thought of Diane again. I wondered whether she might have been at the memorial service, but I guess I would not have noticed anyway. When I tried to call her, her number was disconnected. After a week of indecision I drove to her apartment, but it was empty. I called the rental agency too, but they said Diane had left giving no forwarding address. I called the hotel manager I'm sorry, ma'am, was the reply, she hasn't been at work for a week or so. I was worried and frustrated and I was still deciding what to do when I had a visit from Sarah. We were chatting over some coffee when she asked abruptly, Mom, you ever hear from Dwayne, or seen him? No, I replied honestly. I have had no contact with Dwayne. Neither have I, she said. I do hope he's all right. I hoped he would have tried to contact me sometime, me at least. I'm his mother after all. Henry doesn't have to know if he contacts me. Maybe you and I, of all the family, are the ones Dwayne would trust most and would want to see. I tried not to let her worry add to my own, but then she added. Oh, on something else, about the family, did I tell you I've started to do some genealogy? Genealogy? I asked suspiciously. You know, family tree and stuff. A friend got me slightly interested some time ago, then I got to thinking about it after dad died. I knew that was a generation gone and it set me to thinking about it again. So I have been starting to get some stuff together. I have got as far back as all of your grandparents, that is, my great-grandparents. Then I was filling in gaps, looking at their children and so on and I got to searching some old records. I found a curious thing with an uncle and aunt of yours that lived in Kentucky, the Grants. I discovered a supposed death of a daughter. So that would have been your cousin. The funny thing is that she was called Rachel Grant and yet there's your cousin Rachel. I think you said once she came from Kentucky. Wasn't she Rachel Grant before she married Bill Lawson? Was there a mistake or what? Surely there can't be two Rachel Grants. I felt a cold chill settle in my blood. This was the last thing I needed. To have all of this about Rachel dug up after almost half a century. I would now have to make a clean breast of it. Sarah? I said. I think I have to tell you something. It's very confidential. But did you know you once had an Uncle John? Yes, said Sarah. But what has that to do with Rachel? You said he went off to California in the late fifties. You never heard of him again. Oh, I see. Do you mean he was gay? She asked, just like, Dwayne? I chose my words carefully. No, far from it. John was really interested in girls. I suppose you knew that Rachel came to stay with me about that time? I slowly told Sarah the story of John and the book and Dwayne. Her eyes, narrow at first, gradually widened until she was almost in shock. She looked bewildered. You mean Rachel was really John? That we had a transvestite or transsexual or whatever you call it at our Thanksgiving supper? She got indignant. Mom, how could you? Henry would have had a bird if he'd found out. I was getting annoyed. To hell with that stuffed shirt Henry, I thought, and drove ahead. Not only that. Brace yourself, Sarah. Rachel came back from Arizona to visit me, because I asked her. I needed her help. I was concerned about Dwayne. He was suicidal, because he wanted to be a woman. I wanted to save his life, so we used the same spell on him. The words seemed to sink in slowly at first, then, what, shrieked Sarah, you used magic, you made my son, a man, into a woman? Yes, and that was Diane, that you also invited for Thanksgiving, I said. Sarah gave a piercing cry. I thought she was going to faint. It had to be. I went on. 
I think you have only a small idea of the turmoil and misery Duane was in. He was not just happy to live as a gay man. He wanted to be a woman in all ways. He was desperately unhappy. You saw that when he took that overdose. I was frightened he would kill himself unless we allowed him his wish. I too loved him as a grandson. I would have liked to see him married to a nice girl, but it was not to be. I am just happy to save his life. Sarah was trembling, her hands and eyes twitching. Yes, Mom, you are right. I didn't want to lose him either. But this spell? Where is this book anyway? It's long gone, but we tried something else. I told her the story of our visit to the hypnotist and Duane's conversion. And to think I really liked Diane, she sniffled. Of course you did. And there's no reason to change. She's as nice as Duane was. I thought it not to mention Diane's new photographic career. I hope you will be friends with her. After all, she is your daughter, the daughter you never had. I'd like to see her again, said Sarah slowly. But maybe you'd better go with me. You know where she's living? I bit my lip. Now I would have to tell her. Unfortunately, we had a fight. As you saw, she's turned into a really pretty girl, and she attracted the attention of a photographer and then another one. He has been taking pictures of her, but I thought some of them were getting bit too risque to say the least. Diane said she was being well paid, but I didn't like it, and it degenerated into an argument. We have not spoken for some months. She's even changed her address, so I don't know where to find her. My God, this is worse and worse. Using magic, changing my son into a woman. Now she's into dirty pictures. What next? This wouldn't have happened if you hadn't used that spell, she complained. Yes, you're right, Dwayne would have been dead. I said cruelly. Her hand went to her mouth. Yes, Mom, you're right. I'm sorry. She began crying and we hugged. She looked at her watch. God, look at the time. I'd better get back home. Excuse me, I should tidy myself up. Henry will be wondering. She ran to the bathroom. When she came out she had reapplied her lipstick and combed her hair. She had even repaired the makeup round her eyes, but they were still red. I hoped Henry would not notice. By mom, please let me know if Diane contacts you. Some weeks later I was on my way back from a movie with some friends. It was in the downtown area, and my friend took a wrong turning. I got uneasy when I saw some girls waiting at the street corners. It was quite obvious what they were. I saw a car stop at one, and after a brief conversation the girl climbed into the car. My friend had seen it too, and too tade, but I began wondering what had led the girls to such a dangerous profession. Thank goodness none of my. Then I thought of Diane. I wondered where her road was leading her. That decided me. I knew I would have to start looking for her. It was about that time I finally plucked up enough courage to start sorting through Roy's things. The clothing was easy. I just gave it all to the Sally Ann. The other more personal stuff and his tools I gave to the boys. Roy had been very methodical, so that made my task easy. It was when I was sorting through the last few boxes in the basement I found a handgun, a revolver, with bullets, in the bottom of one box. I was flabbergasted. I had not known it was there. I wondered if Roy had got it when he was in the army. I had always hated guns so maybe he had hidden it away, even forgot about it himself. Sarah called the next day. After asking about myself, she asked if I had heard any more of Diane. I knew it was time I tried to find her. I decided to try with the photographer she had last worked with. When I went to see Jim at his studio, he became a little angry when I asked about Diane. He did not say so, but I guessed he had been hurt by their breakup. At least I was able to get the address of the new photographer from him. This one was called Joe Smurl. Mrs. Van Vliet, said Jim as I left. I'm sorry. I should have been more polite to you. When you see Diane, please let her know that. Tell her I'm sorry the way things turned out. I'd like to hear from her again. The next day I paid a visit to Joe's studio in a small strip mall. 
He seemed to have very little in the way of family pictures, and what I could see was a lot of commercial stuff. When I explained what I wanted he did not answer my question directly. He simply demanded, and who are you that wants to know? I did not care for his manner. A friend, I said, holding my temper in check. I've known her for several months, but I've lost touch with her, and she's moved. I know she used to work as a model with Jim Driscoll, but he said she's now done some work with you. He tried to look at me steadily, but I saw by the flicker of his eyes he was hiding something. Sorry, lady. Yeah, she did some work with me a month or so back, but I haven't seen her for weeks. You don't have her address, do you? No, I never did get it from her. I grimaced and thanked him, but I knew he was lying. Anyone would keep a list of telephone numbers. Either that or he had a superb memory, which I doubted. I slowly walked across the road to my car, but did not drive off right away. I looked back at the studio, through the glass door. As I thought he would, I saw him open his desk, flick through a book and make a call on his cell phone. Obviously this man knew something of Diane. My concern increased. Why would he not give me her address? I decided it would be useful if I got a hold of his phone book. Then I caught myself. Surely if Diane was missing, it was a police matter, but on thinking about it longer, I knew that contacting the police would be fruitless. How much of an interest would police take in me, an old woman who said she hadn't seen a young friend for several months? It would have a very low priority. But how could I get that book? He would recognize me again, so I would either have to break into the office, or sneak the book in the daytime by some ruse. I wondered whether he had a burglar alarm. I looked around the street. It was filled with small commercial buildings and warehouses, yet it was just a block or two off a main road. I guessed it would be fairly quiet in the evening. My mind was made up. I took my chance the next night. I drove past once to check. The office, indeed the whole strip mall, seemed to be deserted. I smeared mud over my license plates, then taking a two large bricks, I threw them through the glass window at the side of the door. It shattered and fell in pieces. It only took a minute for me to be in, open the desk, grab the phone book, and be on my way. I was driving down the main road before I heard police sirens. I examined the book throughout when I got home. There were over a hundred addresses listed, but right away I was successful. I found it under S, Diane's story. It even had her old address and telephone number, crossed out and with a new one, so I knew I was on the right track. I drove to the new address the next day. This apartment block was fancier than the last. Diane must have been doing well, but when I pressed her buzzer there was no reply. The caretaker was cleaning up just inside the door. He must have seen my faint, bewildered old lady look as he opened it. Can I help you, ma'am? Excuse me, young man, I'm trying to call Miss Story, Diane Story, but she doesn't seem to be in. He shook his head. Sorry, ma'am, I haven't seen her for some time, now that you mention it. But her rent's paid up for another month. Maybe she's gone on holiday. Maybe, I said, but I'm her grandmother and I haven't heard from her for some time. I'm worried about her. I managed to coax up a tear. Would you mind if I checked in her apartment? He looked at me warily. I'm not supposed to let anyone in without authorization. Oh, you look as if you're honest. Come up with me. I saw there was something wrong when we opened the apartment door. There were obvious signs of a struggle, some furniture overturned and some of her clothes scattered about the floor. I noticed some shoes with, I thought, very high heels. A short leather skirt, a black bra and a sheer black blouse were strewn on the bed. Uh, do you think we should call the police? asked the caretaker. I shook my head I don't know. Maybe she's just untidy. Let me think about it. Thank you for your help. I went home and thought about my next course. I could call the police, but I still wondered whether even now they would take me seriously. And then there might be questions about her ID and my connection. Henry had many pals on the police and I certainly did not want him to hear about it and start asking questions. I stewed over it for a week, but then I had a brief telephone call. Grandma? It was Diane's voice. 
I'm in trouble. Can, but then she was cut off. Fortunately, I had caller ID and I got the number and a name. I was about to call back when I stopped myself. If she was in trouble, I did not want to warn whoever was causing it. Just on a hunch, I looked through Joe's telephone book again. There it was, the name, the number, and even an address. This address belonged to an old house in a neighborhood just across the city. I sat in the car and watched for some hours. Nothing much was happening, but then after supper there were some visitors, including some fairly busty women. My stomach shrank when I thought it might be a brothel, but there did not seem to be enough men visiting. Then I noticed a small truck draw up and some boxes unloaded. They seemed to have photographic or film equipment of some type. I watched until about 10 that evening. Then I saw some women and men leaving. A short time later a woman left, accompanied by two men. Then there was another woman, a man gripping her arm tightly. I was sure it was to stop her escaping. Her head was held low, but I recognized the woman's walk. I had found Diane at last. I was sure she was being held against her will. I felt myself getting furious and was about to rush out, but I held myself in check. I knew that if I confronted them I was no match for them, and I did not want to alert them that I had discovered Diane. I thought of using Roy's gun, but I knew I could not handle one. Then I had a better idea. I made my preparations the next morning. Then, while I was running mentally over my plans, I got a phone call. It was Jim Driscoll. Sorry to bother you, Mrs. Van Vliet, but it's some time since we spoke. Have you heard anything of Diane yet? I was glad to hear from Jim. I told him what I had found out, then, Jim, I said, how do you feel about driving a getaway car? That evening I waited at the end of the parking lot until the building light went out, then a short time later Diane walked into the parking lot, accompanied this time by another woman and two men. Jim was waiting in my car, the engine running, and close to the last vehicle in the lot. Diane must have caught sight of me as I approached them. She stiffened, but the others paid me little attention, that is until I blasted them with mace. They fell choking and spitting to the ground, while I pushed Diane into my car. Five seconds, and we were away. Diane had collapsed and began sobbing. I knew it was not just from the whiff of mace she had got. I wanted to hold her, but I needed to check if anyone was following us and I waited until we were home. Jim helped Diane into my house, but I took his arm. Jim, I said, thank you so much for your help, but now Diane needs some time, just with me. She's not ready to see you. I'll call you in a day or so. Only then could I hold her while she cried bitterly. At last she was more composed. She told me about her experiences, interrupted by bouts of fresh crying. This guy Joe, he's a slight acquaintance of Jim, he saw some of my pictures and wanted me to try modeling for him. I liked Joe at first. He excited me, so I did not object when he wanted to try some more explicit ones. To tell the truth, I was so proud of my new body. I wanted to show it off and have people admire me. I know Joe liked my body. He used to compliment me on my figure and legs. I thought I was seducing him, but he must have been just using me. Jim heard about it and he got furious and we had a fight. I was getting more attracted to Joe anyway. He was domineering, and that excited me too. We even tried a little bondage. But I guess I gradually got sucked into it, and before I realized, I was really doing mild pornography. Next thing I knew my modeling caught the attention of some small-time producers who were into X-rated movies, among other things. Joe had owed them some money, and in settlement he gave me to them. I objected but they beat me until I cooperated. They kept watch on me at all times, so that I couldn't escape. I only just managed to sneak a call on a cell phone belonging to one of them, but he came back too soon and I only just managed to put it down. Yes. I got that thank goodness. But what do you mean, you were given? I demanded. You are not a slave. I know, Grandma, but it just seemed to go gradually that way and they said they would send Joe's pictures of me to the police if I didn't cooperate. I felt a cold anger, but at least I had her safe. I held her well into the night, then I gave her a sedative and tucked her into bed. 
Next day I kept checking the street outside, but there was no suspicious activity. It was the same the next day. It appeared I had been successful in rescuing her. Diane was very quiet all of that first day. Towards evening she wanted to talk again. Are you angry with me, Grandma? Not anymore. That's irrelevant anyway. I am just glad that I have you back and I can keep you safe. However, I think we should get you checked over by a doctor, just to make sure that you are physically okay. She was fine physically. I did not like the dullness in her eyes, but when I saw the dullness begin to wear off after a week I decided it was time I called Jim. However, I put him off for a day or so, but I called Sarah. She rushed over and I watched a tearful reunion of mother and daughter. We all did a lot of crying that evening. I took their hands in mine. Sarah, I said, I have been thinking. I turned to Diane. About your future. This place has too many problems for you now. I don't want these men finding you again. I've been thinking. Maybe we should use our original plan. You should go away. Why don't you go off to Arizona as we had thought, stay with Rachel. She'd enjoy the company. Sarah was about to protest, but then she nodded slowly. I agree, she said. I thought I should get to know you a bit, I mean a lot better, Diane. I'm sorry that your relationship with Henry and I can't be what it should be with a daughter. I could never tell Henry. I'll miss you, but we want you safe. Mom, Grandma, I've learned my lesson. I will be much more careful from now on. I don't want to leave you, but I think you're right. I have to get away from this place. It has too many risks now. I finally called for Jim to come over. Diane was nervous when he arrived, but I knew she was pleased to see him. I left the room, ostensibly to make some coffee, but really to give them time to themselves. When I returned some minutes later they were holding hands. When I explained that Diane was going away, Jim seemed deflated, but Diane took his arm. Jim, please. I'd like to keep in contact with you. Grandma, can I get Rachel's telephone number from you? And Jim, I'll send you my email address when I get one. And thank you for what you did for me. When we saw her off at the airport I breathed a sigh of relief as I saw her into the departure area. Even so we waited around until the plane was safely away. Some hours later I had a call from Rachel. Hi, just to let you know the trip went okay. Diane had a good flight and looks in good spirits, maybe a little pale, but a few days in the sun will do her the world of good. I have given her the spare bedroom and I know she'll settle in just fine. Now, what about her future? She asked. Give her a few weeks yet to settle down. She may still need a lot of comforting. Then, I've been thinking. Maybe she should go to college, get some more studies and qualifications and like decorating? She likes that. It will keep her busy too. I called Jim to let him know Diane's plans. Thanks again for your help Jim. But I'm sorry I had to drag you into possible trouble. That's okay, Ellen he said. I was glad to help. Oh, by the way, I took over a cocktail to that establishment the other night. I was puzzled. I don't understand. These were pretty scummy folks. It was a Molotov cocktail, he said. As I knew she would be, Rachel was a good correspondent. She gave me fairly regular progress reports on Diane, which I passed on to Sarah. I was especially pleased when she said Jim was now working in Flagstaff and he was seeing Diane regularly. Two years later Sarah and I took a trip to Arizona, at Rachel's invitation. I stood with Sarah and Rachel as we watched the beautiful bride walk down a path in Rachel's yard. I saw the love in Jim's eyes as he waited for her at a bower. Afterwards, there was a special hug from the bride to me, and to Sarah. Thanks for coming, Grandma. Thanks Mom, I'm glad you're here, she whispered. There were only Sarah and me from her family. Neither Henry nor any of the others knew about Diane. We had just told him that Rachel had invited me out, but that as I was getting on, I should have someone to accompany me. Diane had not even told Jim the truth about herself. I think he sensed there was a secret, but he did not pry. I gave a small smile to myself as I noticed the bride's waist. 
Diane had told us the previous day that she was pregnant. Sarah was crying, but with tears of happiness. She gave a rueful smile through her tears. You know, Mom, I always hoped Dwayne would make me a grandmother, but I didn't think it would be quite like this.